Hello, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, where you'll find 25-plus interviews with independent and third-party candidates who are on the ballots this election year, who are the only independent or third-party candidates in their specific districts. There's lots of independent third-party candidates running in all levels of government. We're trying to uh, make sure to um, filter out a little bit uh, candidates that are on the ballot and ones specifically that are the only third party or independent option in their specific district. And you can find them all at libertarianprogressive.com. I've been doing the interviews here at blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. Um, we're a real election channel, I would say, because we cover everyone on the ballot. And so can you. Um, LibertarianProgressive.com is an independent media organization, and uh, we interview everyone on the ballot, Green Party, Independents, Libertarians, No Party Affiliation, other parties. Like today, we're going to interview Anthony Tompkins, Constitution Party candidate for the U.S. House and District 2 in Idaho. Now, just to say, maybe, uh, you know, he'll be able to ride the wave. Maybe some other people will. I mean, in the 90s, you had Ross Perot after the... uh, 2008 Great Recession, you had the Tea Party, then you had the Occupy movement, and maybe something will uh, manifest into electing some more competition into our House of Representatives, our Senate, our Congress, our governors, etc. So there's a lot more going on this 2016, November 8th, besides uh, the presidential election. So let's give Anthony a call here and uh, start this interview. And... And so you all can hear someone else that's going to be on the ballot besides a Republican and a Democrat. Here we go. Hello, this is Anthony. Hi, Anthony. You're on live at blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. This is Thomas Keegan, and folks, today again we're talking with Anthony Tompkins, anthonytompkins.com, T-O-M-K-I-N-S, anthonytompkins.com. And um, again, we're talking with a candidate who's going to be on the ballot in Idaho as uh, for the House of Representatives, District 2, and uh, he's ready to, um, and he's running as a Constitution Party candidate, but you are the only third party option in your district. And are you ready to take the oath? Um, I know everyone takes the oath to, uh, you, you know, when they get sworn in as a Congress member. But I wonder if the Constitution was put in front of them as a bill, if how many people nowadays would actually sign it. Um, and so are you ready to take the oath if your constituents decide to that, that you're the best option for them and uh, elect you this November 8th? I, I am absolutely ready to take that oath. Uh, uh, actually, in 2005, I took a an oath to defend and uphold the Constitution, and I've lived by to fulfill that oath in every way I could possible since that time. So I'm I'm definitely ready to take that oath again. And <laughs> if the Constitution were to come up as a bill, I would definitely vote for it. Right, you put your John Hancock on there, not uh, the smallest font <laughs> there is. And, Maybe um, not quite as good as that. I just <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so when you took the oath in 2005, what was that for, may I ask? Um, so when I say this, it, I also need to mention that I'm a member of the United States Army Reserve and that the uh, Department of Defense and the Department of the Army do not endorse me as a candidate or any other political party for that matter. Um, but I joined the United States Army Reserve in 2005, and at that time I took the oath of enlistment, uh, which states that I will defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So, and it states a lot Great. more than that, but that's, that's oh, well, we, more we appreciate <laughs> that, and that's good for the voters to know about that information, and uh, so that's very good. And actually here we... You know, I, personally, I'd like to see a lot more independents and third-party candidates, but we're not endorsing anyone either, but we are endorsing exactly. a fair system. And uh, a fair system would include 
everyone in the debates having more equal time, uh, you know, a fair system, basically. So have you been in any debates? Are there any debates coming up for your districts? Or? Um, the, the the primary debates that usually take place in Idaho are uh, a function of the uh, Idaho Public Television. And because uh, they uh, told me that my particular campaign didn't meet the criteria, Basically, I'd, I'm not spending enough money, I guess. And uh, the Democrat uh, contender did not even respond to their uh, to their inquiry for them to participate in the debate. So it was uh, actually every congressional canceled in the state of Idaho, as far as Idaho public television goes. I'm, uh, I'd be open to a debate, and I'm going to try and uh, contact the the other uh, people in this race for to see if they would wouldn't mind doing a debate in some other way. But as uh, up until that happens, I, I I don't see any debates happening here in Idaho for, that, for our particular Let me race. Ask you if I have a couple of follow-up questions just about that, and we'll get to the issues that your platform, yeah. but um. You are on the ballot, right? Yes. I okay. am on the ballot the, as the Constitution Party okay. candidate. So the taxpayers are paying their tax dollars, you know, to print your name on the ballot and, and to, you know, whatever record keeping there needs to be done. I mean, you're just as on the ballot as anyone else that's on the ballot. And you are willing yep. to do debates. I mean, you'd be willing to do yeah. one, two, or, or three debates, right? Yeah. Oh, as many as need be. <laughs> And if you were elected this November 8th and you were the incumbent two years from now, uh, you would be willing to debate anyone who is challenging you? Is that fair to say? Oh, I, I, would, I would encourage it. I think that that takes a – I mean, I, I'm going to be the first one to say I'm not a perfect person by any means. And if I don't have an opportunity to hold myself accountable uh, every so often, I'm going to – uh, fail at my goals of being a, an honest person and an honest candidate. So I I feel that debate and involving others in the process, keeping it open instead of uh, backdoor kind of stuff and closed off, I, I think that kind of stuff will uh, keep me the integrity-based candidate that the people of Idaho deserve. Sure. It kind of reminds me of, um, and I've used this analogy before, but, and I don't want to mi mix boxing with, uh, you know, Congress, but if someone was like a heavyweight <laughs> champion and, um, and they sat on that, you know, belt for years and uh, they kept having people, ch you know, willing to challenge them, but they never did. There has to be some point where they lose their title um, just by default by not willing to challenge it anymore, you know, you would think. Um, but, well, let's get to uh, the topics here. I mean, you you know, your website, yeah. Anthony Tompkins, T-O-M-K-I-N-S dot com. Um, it says here right on there, uh, U.S. House, Idaho, 2nd Congressional District, uh, your basic platform, abortion, rights to arms, health care, private property, immigration, taxes, state sovereignty, and um, and we might follow up with some of that, but let's just start from the top, uh, abortion. And could you explain um, how you would represent uh, the second district in Idaho regarding um, the issue of abortion? Well, I, like it states on my website and, and everywhere else I've, I've mentioned it, uh, I, I do believe that life, uh, human life begins at conception and that our government is tells us, um, well, our government and any government in existence, its primary purpose is to defend rights and of those rights. Uh, life is one of them. So I believe that as part of that, uh, my role in Congress, if I were to be elected, would be to find those ways to defend that, that right of life, even for those who are uh, haven't been born yet. Okay, and let me just ask you two follow-up questions regarding that. Um, the first follow-up question is, are there any exceptions at all? 
um, where, yeah. Now, personally, I, I, the only exception I, I would tolerate in my own personal life is that one only after um, a lot of thought and prayer in, in considering that. Um, considering where we are in the world right now, I would fight for any bit of uh, protection of life that we could get at this time. Um, so if, if there had to be an exception for cases of rape or incest, I would, I would tolerate those just so that we could uh, work towards uh, becoming more life-minded as a society. Okay, and that's fair enough, and and that's um, actually uh, I appreciate that answer. And also, uh, the second follow-up question is: um, Could there be more education done about it? It could have as much of an impact um, as the laws, also. So, you know, just uh, kids learning, you know, the res- the responsibility that they have about bringing someone into the world. Could there be a little more education, and hopefully, maybe some preventing them getting into situations that they might not be ready for? Um, I, I do believe there could be more education. I, I don't believe that the, the author of that education should necessarily be the federal government. Um, I mean, there, there's plenty of examples of where we wouldn't want um, the federal government teaching in, in our schools and everything else, and there's definitely a an argument against that, but uh, I, I believe that that education would be better administrated from a, a local level. And I mean, it, it in in all reality, it comes down to a responsibility of the of the parents of the children. And, and I mean, in the rare cases of uh, households that don't have a necessarily an active parent or something like that, it, you can go to the secondary options of school and and even uh, ecclesiastical or church authorities to help administer in that. But, I mean, it, it's kind of a a bad situation in, in either way when it, when it comes to that because you want the, the result, that, you know, using the federal government to, to administer that it is almost just as bad as, as not. So, yeah, I, I you believe know, I, that. And, that's fair enough. I mean, I can totally, I understand what you're saying. And so it's just a general answer, maybe not necessarily as far as laws go. Um, now let's get into some of the other issues that will help, um, you know, uh, we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so here's some of the issues you're going to bring to the table to um, help secure those rights. And, um, and so, and hopefully to help. And, and if there's a totally better environment, that might help reduce abortions and crime and, and yeah. lots of different things and have more peace and prosperity. So it is a holistic type of thing. And you do have here rights to arms. Uh, so uh, talking about the Second Amendment, um, right to defend oneself, uh, how would you approach that as um, a U.S. representative, sir? Um, so, I mean, this one's fairly simple. It's uh, as the Second Amendment states, we... Uh, have the, a right to arms. Um, and that, I mean, some people mistake with that that it's for hunting or sport shooting or something like that. And in reality, the the Second Amendment is is designed to protect us from uh, potential those who would potentially attack us, and also from a tyrannical government. So I I, I believe that uh, along with all other rights, the, the right to bear arms. Um, shall not be infringed. It, we, we need to, to work to keep all of our rights, and and that one helps us to protect us and also to keep um, other entities that would try to claim uh, usurp authority over us to keep them in check. Sure. I mean, and it's good to have good software, but you got to have good hardware as well, you know, and um, – <laughs> but. And that makes me think, because if there was someone who is devious trying to, you know, be tyrannical, I bet they would have to really think twice about doing that in the U.S., you know, with um, how many responsible people people do have arms. Now, um, 
stating that you do believe uh, people have the right to defend themselves um, as a fundamental right, the Second Amendment, um, is there anything outside of that that we can still do that you think um, to help reduce crime uh, be, but not take away any of the Second Amendment rights? So is there, uh, is there other things that could be done possibly to, that you think could help? Um, and crime has been going down, by the way, for the last couple of decades. Oh, uh, absolutely. Even so. Yeah. I mean, it, it, in, in all honesty, it comes back to that holistic approach that we mentioned, or, well, you mentioned earlier. Um, but it, it's, it, as far as other items to reduce crime and in that effect, I too many other approaches than, I mean, just realizing the rights that we have and being willing to defend those on a personal level. I, I mean, it, it comes down to an individual thing of, of those who would be willing to commit those crimes. And, and, the, and the more that we, I mean, there's little activities that anybody could do. Is, and as far as governments go, uh, you know, maintaining an, an active police force that, you know, it, it, that doesn't, that creates a, a relationship with the community that um, the community won't shy away from them necessarily, but be be open to them, you, you, kind of like the old uh, uh, Andy Griffith show in the, in the you know, the law enforcement in that program. Uh, <laughs> anybody would have loved to talk to those folks. So. Yeah, absolutely. Andy Griffith, I mean, who that would be, and Barney Fife, I mean, those would be um, everyone's favorite neighborhood peace officers, right? Um, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And actually, one of his things was um, he didn't carry a gun. And there was one episode where Barney Fife asked him, you know, why don't you carry a gun? And he said he wanted the people to trust him. And I'm not saying cops shouldn't not carry guns, but it just kind of shows uh, a sense of, you know, how they were thinking uh, then. Oh, and, yeah. um, well, and, and I mean, as part of that, I, I mean, uh, everybody having an opportunity to own a firearm, I don't think it's necessary for everybody to own a firearm, just to have that right and that opportunity. And I mean, one can choose the way that they defend themselves. If it's through martial arts training or planning practices underneath their windows, I, I mean, there, there's very various means and, and efforts. And I, I want to try my, to avoid the closed-mindedness of saying that firearms are the only way that we can protect ourselves. They're just a, a certain tool that seems to be rather effective at the job rather than the only tool. Oh, I hear you, Anthony. I mean, this might sound silly, but, I mean, you take a poll of how many people like Star Wars, I guarantee if there was such a thing as a lightsaber, no one, you wouldn't be able to prevent people from getting one of those. Everyone oh, no, would I, want I, one I, of those. <laughs> those would be one of the most dangerous things, <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> So I, I know I'd want to get one. I'd you know pay a lot yeah, for same one. Here. So um, <laughs> so anyways. Um, so now healthcare is another issue. Um, so what what do you think? Um, how would your approach be regarding um, healthcare issues? Well, I, I mean, as far as the Constitution, we read in Article One, Section Eight. Um, well, we we don't read anything about healthcare, unfortunately. So that, that means that it, it's not really a function of our, our federal government. It is something that can be left up to the states. I, and, uh, I mean, it, I, I personally wouldn't want it at the state level, but I'm running for a federal office, so I won't get too much into that. But it's, it's not a function of the federal government to be involved in, in health care. And, and unfortunately, the, the way it, it, that it's it's come out from the people that I've talked to, at least in the Idaho Second Congressional District, that many of them are opposed and, and they they feel like they've been cheated in a sense because instead of their health care being a decision between them and their doctor, their, their health care has become uh, partly decided by a bureaucracy almost 2,000 miles away from them. So it's... I, I, I am strongly against the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, and I would uh, do all that I could to re repeal that, and I would fight any kind of legislation that would 
force uh, Americans into purchasing something they don't want to purchase, uh, be it an insurance or a type of car or anything else. I mean, it, it, I, I'm a huge fan of people being able to decide what they, they want to do. I, I know I'm running for Congress in a, in a constitutional republic, not a not a communist state. So, Right. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate you not wanting me to be forced to purchase <laughs> from a private insurer without getting a penalty. I mean, what a way to do business. Um, and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and what if I want alternative types of uh, treatments and, um, you know, and what about the FDA? Do you think there could be some reform with the FDA? I mean, it takes, seems like, I mean, I understand they want to protect people from, you know, uh, things that don't work and they want to do some research. I can understand that. But some people are waiting forever, and sometimes it seems like it takes a billion dollars just to get, you know, some kind of new miracle drug to go through, and and they're just regulating this and that. And it seems like the people who go in there used to be the CEOs of, you know, pharmaceutical companies or Monsanto or or whatever. You think there could be any reform (laughs) in there? Um, I, I would definitely revisit the FDA. I, I, I mean, it, it comes back to that, that, you know, if we can find it in Article 1, Section of A of the Constitution, then we can keep it. And, I, I mean, I'd have trouble finding it in there. It, it, it could, I don't think it really meets the, the standard of, of what the federal government is authorized to do. And, and that's not to say that I would necessarily fight to get rid of it immediately. Um, I, I can see some merit out of the organization, but I, I would definitely revisit it and and consider other alternatives, because like you said, there's a certain amount of uh, I don't know if cronyism would be the right word for that, but there there, there seems to be kind of a, a buddy system on on how what the type of folks that can get in there. It wouldn't be someone like you or me who would be the administrator of, well, I, I don't know you that well, but, uh, you know, uh, some person coming off the street to be the administrator of that, it's usually a, a CEO of a large corporation, so they would have a, a vested interest in manipulating uh, the regulations created by that bureaucracy to to meet their particular agenda. Now, that gives me a follow-up question. Like, uh, let's say you were elected to Congress November 8th, and, um, you know, that would be a very exciting day. It would be very exciting uh, to be the first um, – well, who knows? There might be others this year, but I think the first Constitution yeah. Party candidate elected to the House of Representatives. And um, I would believe so. What would be your approach dealing with other Congress members? Um, how would you try to build consensus? Um, what would you try to do? I mean, let's say you have two years. You don't know if you're going to get elected again. Maybe you will. Maybe you'll be a very popular person. People will um, see, you know, your efforts. But, you know, you have to kind of prioritize in some aspects. What would be your approach? Um, what would you prioritize? What would you try to accomplish in those two years, you know? Um, the priority on things would, I mean, besides the things already coming down the pipe and, and just in voting on those things, I, I would definitely fight for things like the, against the Affordable Care Act and, and anything that uh, would infringe upon any of our rights, but specifically uh, upon our, our right to bear arms or uh, any religious freedoms. Uh, any of our rights to, uh, to own property, uh, and and then making sure that we have the adequate amount of defense that we need for our country. Uh, uh, basically, not not sacrificing the uh, what we need for defending our country and and helping to make sure that we have a system that honors our our veterans and service members uh, while they are serving and also uh, after they they get out, making sure that their medical interests are facilitated correctly and and that uh, we take care of them as as much as they've done to take care of us. 
Great. Well, I'm going to ask you some follow-up questions about uh, veterans and, um, you, you know, foreign policy. I'll say that for last, especially since you have some experience in that. Definitely want to hear, um, you know, some solutions, uh, some proposals, um, some feedback. Uh, what, now, you did mention private property, and uh, I think you mentioned the word eminent domain on, on your website here. Uh, so yes. there seems to be, um, you know, that's an issue, uh, actually, uh in the last couple of decades, especially, I've been seeing some more news articles about it. So what is your stance on private property and eminent, eminent domain as well? I, I'm a huge fan of it. I mean, I, a couple of years ago, I finally, well, uh, the local bank owns my house right now, but purchasing my own home and that is the amount of freedom that I felt and, and everything else to, you know, I, I now have this place that I don't have to ask permission to paint it a certain color or to, you know, grow a certain type of flower or to dig a hole wherever I'd like. It, it, it's a kind of a very powerful and inspiring thing. And I, I feel that when, and I mean, there are, there are things I, I will admit that um, the society, you know, would potentially need a local municipality, may need a road or, or something like that. But I believe that uh, it, it, that we've allowed the federal and even state and local governments to to be the authority that basically we give them so much authority that we we just let them come in and do whatever the hell they want. And I. I I, I want to help people to to realize that it you know that well if I live next door to you and I wanted to put a and I put a shed in my backyard but I don't have enough room to get around my house to get to it so I decide to put a road through your yard to get to my shed in my backyard I mean the, we're we're going to be going back to that boxing match that you were mentioning earlier right <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean it, it if people realize that it you know, it's not something I can go and do. I can't go and just put a road on my neighbor's yard. I have to, you know, ask their permission and and perhaps even try to persuade them. I, I think that the, the process for eminent domain needs to be restricted in the interest of the, of the property owner uh, rather than, uh, well, and I mean, it, it, there's there's so many, my, my own my dad has a, a, a piece of, roadway on his property that a piece of or a piece of or a portion of property that his local municipality decided would be a road and he has to maintain it as a road but I mean if anybody drives by there they, they realize that that's never ever going to become a road because it dead ends into a railroad track but he has to maintain it as such because of this this eminent domain so it's and it, you know he doesn't have that property and and there's no particular interest except for one day a city plan decided hey we need a road right there and nobody uses it but I mean there, there's these little examples here and there but there are even I, I would assume very much more uh, abuses of this power and I, I would want to fight against it just to just to help other Americans out. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think we do need a champion for that. There's tons of uh, examples all, all across. I mean, people having their properties taken for private interests, um, something that isn't even a public use. And and not to say, I, I don't think, you know, I mean, there really isn't hardly any examples that I think that would see fits. I mean, if, um, like you said, they should have to negotiate with the property owner and, and offer something that would, entice a property owner to want to, uh, you know, work something out. And, um, you know, you hear things about people trying to grow gardens. They are not even allowed to grow a garden in their yard and stuff like that. And I really like the way you explain, like, you know, how, you know, your, your first house or, and, and, you know, digging the holes to plant a tree or whatever. I mean, you know, I had a similar experience. I mean, getting my own house um, a couple years back and, you know, the bank still owns it for me too, but it's nice I can paint it whatever color I want. I can grow a garden. I mean, it's just, you know, those kind of freedoms uh, just, you know, I mean, that's something that, you know, I hope everyone doesn't forget about and uh, 
things just seem so micromanaged or you have that, you know, writing on the back of your shoulder of just what if always. And, um, you know, there's just yeah. not always that peace of mind uh, that people, you know, take for granted sometimes. Um, so now you did have an issue here also on immigration. Could you tell us um, your approach to immigration, sir? Yeah. And I, and I, uh, I mean, as it states on the website, I, I'm not going to support um, the, they use the term blank and amnesty, uh, which basically offers uh, the majority or portion of those that, of illegal immigrant status. Um, it changes them over to a uh, visa type of sponsorship program. Uh, and I mean, there, there's other details to it, but I, I believe that it, it, it attempts to thwart the, the system that we already have in place. Now, I, I also want to mention that it, it's, uh, as it states in the Declaration of Independence, I believe that all men are created equal and are endowed with certain unalienable, unalienable rights um, of those life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But I believe that it's for all people, who, no matter where they're born and you know, no matter their, their situation, so I believe that the, the Indian child being born in India right now is, has these same exact rights that the child being born in uh, Arlington, Texas would have at the same time. Now it comes down to the government that defends those rights, and we as a society have decided to defend the rights of our citizens. Uh, we've had to impose certain restrictions and, uh, on immigration and uh, those mostly to protect us from invasion, uh, diseases, and, and other, other things. And, I mean, and there's even the dynamic of, of uh, uh, business owners attempting to take advantage of a, a certain populace that uh, of that illegal immigrant status and, and the problems associated with that. But, so I, I, I always like to state that, that illegal immigration and uh, that it's not because I don't believe that someone is less, or that I do believe that somebody is less than me or not. I, I believe that we are all equal, but uh, as part of our defense, that or as part of defending our rights, we have to do certain things. And I, I do not, I don't support mass deportation going door to door because that starts to infringe upon our rights. I don't want someone coming to my door and asking immigration status of all the people in my house. And I, you know, I, I wouldn't want that for anybody else. So I, I believe that our, uh, instead of the the stormtrooper mentality that we need to have a process that uh, using the work restrictions and uh, benefits restrictions uh, of those of illegal immigrant status, we can, you know, slowly encourage them to go back to their countries of origin and uh, work towards coming back to the United States legally and uh, becoming productive members of our society. Yeah, yeah, I can appreciate that. It sounds uh, very balanced and, and reasonable. And um, now you also had an issue here, uh, two more issues, uh, taxes and state sovereignty. So if you could tell us, um, your taxes, always very interesting to hear about. What is uh, your approach to taxes? I, I personally believe that we are spending way too much. Um, we, we do have a debt problem. You know, yeah, twenty trillion dollars uh, coming up soon. That's absolutely insane. And I mean, we can't we can't afford that. I, you know, I'm I'm a young person. I, I, I don't, you know, I'm I'm only twenty eight years old, so I'm I know that I'm going to be hurdled with this for a long time. And I, I would like to try and and slow the bleeding, as some would say. Uh, you know, for myself, but also for you know my my children in the future, and and you know other 
young people here in America, it, it's it's it'll eventually cause significant problems for us. But getting back to the taxes, I I don't believe that we we need to do an increase on taxes to fix this problem. I, I believe that it's if we follow the Constitution of the United States and follow the follow it to in, in exactness to what we are authorized to uh, that the federal government is authorized to have its hands in, that we'll be able to reduce the number of these services that uh, the federal government shouldn't be operating in. Plenty of of the funds that we need staying at our current levels uh, of taxation and be able to eventually pay off our debt. Um, and as part of that, I, I I mean, I, and I'd have to play with the numbers a lot on it, and I'm not, I'm unfortunately not a numbers guy, I'm a copier technician. But the I would be willing to look into I, I've heard some ideas of a fair tax or even a, a consumption tax, and I, I think those are some very, very interesting concepts that we could uh, attempt to use to try and make our our tax program a lot more transparent and, and a lot easier. I mean, it, I don't even know how many pages there are of the tax code, but it, it's that absolutely ridiculous how how awful it is, how big that bureaucracy is. Yeah, if you're going to read that, you're not going to have time to read anything else, I don't think. Um, and uh, <laughs> The consumption tax is a sales tax, basically, and I um, yes. have seen things that actually, supposedly, from what I've read, is that's the only kind of constitutional, except maybe some tariffs, import taxes, yep. but that really is the only constitutional type of national tax that is currently allowed. So, um, yeah, that's and good. you're well versed. And I, <laughs> I think Gary Johnson said from the Libertarian Party that, it, and I, I like this statement. Um, I'm not endorsing anyone, but he said something like, oh, "If okay. we got rid of the income tax, then, you know, if that doesn't have an, you know, an influx of corporations coming to this country, he doesn't know what would. Uh, you know, we probably have an immigration <laughs> problem of uh, companies wanting to set up shop here. Yeah. You know, so." That would be a good thing, I guess. Um, so um, I live in Florida, and, and, and actually there's a couple other states like Washington State. Um, you know, there's no state income tax. Uh, there's just a sales tax. And, um, you know, and, and it probably does reduce a lot of red tape. Um, not that there still isn't a lot. What about state sovereignty? Um, what is your issue on that? You know, the Tenth Amendment, how would you approach state sovereignty in this time and age? And I, and, and I use that, that term a little bit loosely and maybe a little bit inaccurate depending on, on how, even though I, 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 I'm not necessarily suggesting that Idaho become a sovereign country by any means, but mostly we, uh, we need to work towards getting more of our sovereign, sovereignty back, uh, meaning that we return some of the power that in the federal government back to the state of Idaho. In, in the state of Idaho, we have a very large percentage of public land that are, that are managed by the federal government. And there are many here in the state that um, feel that there's too much external influence in the, in the use of our public lands um, and the regulations and, and the management of them. Uh, and uh, there's even been uh, some some talk of bills in Congress of working towards creating a state-based uh, management of those federal lands, um, which, which I would strongly encourage. I, I have, it's a little bit hard to say to return all of those lands back to the state right now, just because the the state wouldn't be prepared for it at all. But to to work in a program where the state of Idaho could manage the majority of their public lands and just basically see how it went and work from there to see if Idaho could 
uh, begin to not only manage but also have the authority of those of those lands and and just other there's other powers of the federal government that are taken away from the states um, such as the the authority over education I, I believe that uh, that should be returned to the states and, and the the authority of uh, over marriage it, that shouldn't be vested in, in the federal government it's it, it, I, I won't necessarily say that I, I believe that it should be uh, controlled by the states either. I, I'm, I personally believe that uh, marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God, and I, I believe that uh, governments getting involved in it just muddy the waters on on any type of marriage. So I, I but that kind of stuff needs to be uh, returned back to its rightful place with the state instead of having the federal. Yeah, I think that reminds me of um, what you're just saying. Uh, so I guess some libertarians and probably some Constitution Party people have, some people have the stance or some, I guess, factions of each party have, have proposed, uh, like what you're saying, why have the government in it in the first place at all? I mean, you could have the government to... Um, support contracts between two people and inheritance things and, and things like that, but the actual marriage itself, I mean, you know, that's between you well, and I mean, God. The, or Yeah. The governor of Idaho wasn't at my wedding. The county clerk wasn't at my wedding. Not, none of those people participated in my wedding except for a little piece of paper that has a gold seal on it stating that I'm legally married in the state of Idaho. So it's it it really I mean it comes down to that it, and I but the the other the ecclesiastical leaders that were at my wedding and my family and everything else I I'll hold them dear and I'll find more authority in that throughout the eternities uh, than I ever would in that little piece of paper that the government gave me so that I could legally say I'm married. All right, Anthony, I hear you on that. And, and another state sovereignty issue that is um, present nowadays is um, states like Alaska, Washington, Colorado, Oregon, and um, I think Washington, D.C. There might be a couple other ones, but uh, those are the ones that are probably most heard of where they have decided to legalize, um, I'll just call it cannabis. And, uh, oh, yes. and, and now they have some, you know, they kind of have that, kind of question over their shoulders of whether, you know, how long it's going to last. A lot of banks won't even let them, you know, some of the business owners open up a bank account, et cetera, because they're scared that the federal government's going to, you, you know, who knows what's going to happen. They just don't know. There's not that confidence or certainty. I mean, should the states have a right to, uh, you know, legislate that how they want, legalize it, tax it, let people, because I mean, even now there's, it's, there's like refugees going to, some of those states because kids have uh, multiple sclerosis and, and some other conditions, you know, where they want to, you know, have ability to, you know, get a certain plants. I mean, yeah, I, uh, I, I personally am not a, a necessarily a fan of, of cannabis or marijuana or, or whatever else. Same time, the federal government has, does not have the authority to regulate it. So I, I believe in the, the uh, and I, I'd like to use the uh, wording decriminalization of uh, that particular illegal drug just because, I mean, it, it, the federal government has no authority on it and it should be turned over to the states and uh, to where they can decide on, you know, whether they like it or not. In, in Idaho, there's a good chance that we would probably not be for it. Uh, I, I, from what I talk to with a lot of people around here, it, uh, there, there are some that are would be very happy if something like that happened, but uh, we decided at the state level, like uh, Colorado and, and Washington and, uh, and Oregon have done that. And, so you're you know, saying they should be I, free I, to do what they want. Exactly. <laughs> And I, I know it does cause some, some issues for interstate commerce 
And I mean, and, and those can be addressed on a, a case by case issue. I, I mean, here in the state of Idaho, we, we do have uh, some issues with that, uh, with our uh, the neighboring states of Washington and Oregon, uh, where some folks uh, living right across the border have, have violated some laws just because they uh, were a little bit careless about about some of their activities and and you know their and bringing the illegal substance into the state of Idaho be mitigated at a much more local level and in the state level rather than it being uh, something that the, the federal government decides on, with, with the exception of the, the military. The, the federal government does have the, the authority to decide whether or not uh, the use of substances like that are, and just like any business, it should have right. that, that right. If I, own, if I own a business, well, I, my family used to own a security company, and we wouldn't want anybody, you know, using illegal drugs or anything like that working for us because the potential dangers of that and also the stigma. So, I, it, you know, it, it should be smoke cigarettes during your 12 hours of being at the facility and that it limited you on that. And I think that uh, businesses should have the opportunity to uh, to make judgment calls on their own on, in, in that respect. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, and, and their freedoms also have to be considered as well. And I'm not advocating anyone to, uh, you know, necessarily get high, but I do have two questions for people. Yeah. I mean, one, one is, I mean, consider does the crime, if it is a crime fit the time? I mean, there's people in there who have done that, who are serving a longer sentence than, you know, rapists and, and murderers. That, that's one point to, think about i mean there are some people like that and two there are other uses um for it besides uh you know getting high per se um so now let me just ask you uh, some follow-up questions some questions i've asked most everyone on here um yeah uh let's see here um what about trade i i mean would you support like uh, would you at this current time or would you need to read it first i know a lot of people haven't even read it yet um like the tpp, the TPP. Um, I, I would not support it I, I believe that they're well. Uh, it's funny how you mentioned how you, you you know you need to read it first. There's um, there's been some talk even in some of the congressional races in my own state here, uh, not my own, but in some of the other ones that you know well we'll we have to pass it before we know what's in it kind of attitude. And you know we, we can't keep doing those kind of things. There's there are too there's too much in the TPP, um, I mean, it, 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 it's being proposed here in Idaho that it's, it's a great thing for jobs and it's going to bring jobs to the state of Idaho. And, and I, you know what, I'm probably not going to be able to disagree with that because, it, you know, it probably will bring jobs to Idaho, but I'm more afraid of the jobs that it's going to take away, uh, not just from Idaho, but also from the, the rest of the United States. And I... I I am a fan of trade and even uh, free trade with with countries that we are, are favorable with. Um, but I believe that uh, the TPP gets way too much too much power in the wrong places instead of keeping that power vested in in the people of the United States. All right, all right, and 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 it's fair to say. I mean, you haven't read it yet. I mean, it's it's probably almost as big as the IRS, you know, tax code. So it'd be oh, nice yeah. if there's some bills that were readable. Um, let me ask you this: uh, three yeah. final questions here. Um, you know, Edward Snowden's been in the news. Um, I'm not asking you, you know, whether you agree or not, because you might not have all the facts on that. But um, but just whistleblowers in general. I mean, especially in the federal government. I mean. Private businesses can handle, you know, how they decide to handle it, and and you know their scrutiny is going to be judged by the public. But I'm talking about the federal government. Um, and, you know, should there be a way for because I, I mean whistleblowers can, you know, there's such a huge bureaucracy, and uh, people are saying he should have went up the right channels. Well, I've read some news stories where people before him have tried to go up the right channels and. And it seems like they had backlash for that. I mean, so is there anything <laughs> that we can help to do for people who want to speak up? I mean, you know, I mean, I think uh, 
any good organization is going to want to hear from the people on the ground. I mean, even, you know, before 9-11, there's FBI agents that kept saying, you know, we need to take a look at these guys and um, their superiors, uh, you know, kind of pushed them aside. And so, um, you know, that's kind of, so is there a way for it, people? It's a little bit, so I, I, and I, I'm not entirely sure the question you're going to ask me yet, but I, it, unfortunately, I have to be very careful how I answer this particular question, considering okay. my position in the military. Um, sure. I don't know if okay, well, it's known personally. Yeah. Um, but as far as going up a, a chain of command and everything else, it, I, I will say that you know he if he did if he is accused and found guilty of committing a crime against the United States that. He should stand trial for that. Now, am I saying that if I were in a similar situation, would I have done something like that? I, I cannot say whether or not, uh, depending on you know the level of that. Uh, but I, it, you know, and I would accept any any punishments necessary and any discipline necessary. But uh, it's you know it. it in that in that particular case, it's well. It, it comes, it, you know. Someone would ask me a question like, you know, what would I some rules to protect my soldiers and my in the Army Reserve, and I absolutely would do everything I needed to to protect them. Uh, I would never say I would ever violate a rule, but I would I would do anything I needed to to protect my soldiers. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's a tough question considering the position that you're in. And I'm not asking about him specifically, but just um, the system. Okay. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, just, you know, I'm just saying I think it'd be worth looking at at least, uh, you know, um, just trying to put more safeguards for people who do want to speak out um, so they can do it legitimately, you know, without oh, any yeah. backlash. Uh, definitely and, uh, some. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we need a more transparent government in a lot of respects. I mean, there there are some things that, because of the expedient, expedient I can't speak right now, because of you know military operations and everything else that we need to, to keep secret, of course. Uh, but but there are a lot of things that should be more transparent in our government. And, uh, and I won't say whether or not one of of the things that Edward Snowden made, that those were some of those things. But um, we we need to work towards having a more transparent. Uh, transparent government because they, I mean the representatives are working for us. They're they're not there to you know be the babysitter or anything else. They're there being our voice, uh, basically doing the things that we have the right to do, but we have vested in them that right uh, so that we you know because it, it's better when we work together. Yeah, and, and you know, there's probably a lot of things I, I you know, I, I can't speak on, but in the general principle, you could kind of compare, like, Internet Explorer versus Firefox. One is, um, you know, kind of closed source, and uh, it's proprietary, and there's advantages to that. And another is completely open source. It does make it more vulnerable, but at the same time, uh, those vulnerabilities get fixed very quickly because you have everyone in the world participating and contributing to it and um, exploiting those vulnerabilities quick so so that it gets fixed quicker. So, I mean, which one is stronger in the long run? I guess uh, who I love knows. That you maybe that up. I actually use yeah. Linux, so. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> so, so there's uh, our vulnerability is also our biggest strength in, in some other words, you could say. I mean, yeah. just like football, I mean, some coaches are going to want to play a very close game and keep it, you know, within three points. And others are just going to say, here's a playbook, and we're just going to run it right down the center, and we're going to tell you exactly what we're going to do, you know. And um, yep. so both have been successful, I guess. Uh, so let me ask you, is, uh, here's a question about um, – veterans and, and foreign policy and the military. I'm going to ask it in a real general way, but uh, to give a vision uh, in a sense, like, um, you know, if you kind of gave a vision about what it's like to have your own property, and I really appreciated that. So kind of in the same aspect, if you can envision, let's just say maybe five or 10 years out, um, 
uh, the ideal, um, you know, if you were looking down from space and observing Earth and uh, we got to, you know, started going on the right path, um, you, you know, instead of how you would get there, what would it be that you would envision where we'd be at? Like, how would you see America's role in the world? Um, how would you envision our troops being taken care of if it was ideal? So I'm more of asking you not necessarily, you can explain how we would get there, but uh, what would it look like in 10 years if it was ideal? Oh, wow, that is a absolutely wonderful question, especially with all the talk of gloom and, and doom and everything else nowadays. Well, I, I guess we could be celebrating things like the, the iPhone 13 and little fun things like that. But I, I, I would really, I, I, I would really like to to see things that, I mean, if we, on the right path, so ten years out, um, we may not be completely out of debt, but we have a, a budget that is not only balanced, but is working to pay off that that enormous debt we, that we have, and that we've, you know. In ten years, hopefully, we've we've practically practically have conquered it, and then, uh, you know, having keeping our defense up, because there are those that will that wish to destroy us. I, I'm not going to sugarcoat that by any means, uh, for one reason or another. Um, but keeping our defense up and and keeping working to update portions of our military, I. I personally work with a, a system in the in the military. And it's a supply type of system uh, for petroleum, but it, it, it's been in operation since 1985, with relatively few updates to the system. And and then this is, and I'm not saying that my specific situation is, you know, the the paramount of what we need to take care of, but it's, it's an example of. You know, we have a lot of outdated systems in the military, and there's been so much technology that has come out, you know, since 1985 in the last 31 years that we could improve upon many of these different systems or uh, supply systems, vehicles, and, and we have seen some of those improvements. Uh, but but uh, you know there's still many things to be improved upon. So in the, in the next ten years, I would I would definitely like to see those things those things worked on and, and, and a little bit prioritized. Um, that way we can keep up our our defense and make sure that we're we're relevant in the world. Um, we have had advantages in the past of being the world military power. So that's and as long as we don't abuse that power, I, I think we'll be all right. And other things like eminent domain being more of a an open concept. If you know a neighborhood decided that they needed a road somewhere, and they go to Bill and hey, we, it'd be really nice to have a road here, and you know, and they decide with him instead of you know deciding behind his back and fighting against him and bringing courts into it, and, you know, and, and working more with people on a a smaller and local level, uh, removing the power from entities that are, are so far away that we we grow calloused and careless about what they really do. I mean, th there's so many people that that think that the elections are, are a joke, especially for the federal government. I mean, especially with some of the recent debates and stuff. And they, they you know, they've gotten this carelessness for it. And you know, so they don't want to take on those issues anymore. So I, I love to see things turned back to a more local level, so that we we have more we have the involvement in the government that the founding fathers intended when they uh, drafted the uh, originally the Articles of Confederation, and then eventually the, the Constitution of the United States. I, I would really like to see that in the next 10 years. Great, great. And um, so you have a good environment and good things are going to come out of that good environment. Um, and I mean, just, just uh, do you think there should be a paper trail for election uh, ballots? 
yeah, I, I think that's I think that's reasonable. I, I mean, they, there there are, and I work in. Fortunately, I have a vested interest because, you know, the more paper that gets printed, the more money I make, and in my particular industry, <laughs> being a copier technician. But, uh, the, you know, there are advantages to the electronic system, but there there is also, you know, a, a certain amount of corruption that. And that you know, there, there's a lot of things that haven't been worked out in, in the digital world, and and a lot of people haven't updated themselves to the the knowledge of what it what it is really. I mean, it, even the even if you know the encryption and and everything else made it practically impossible to rig an election, perception alone could be de- devastating because most people don't know how that stuff works. So I I think keeping it as a paper based system. Uh, could be beneficial, but it, it more. I, I think it more needs to be decided at a, at a state level. Personally, um, don't mind a paper system by any means. Yeah, or it could be a combination. At least have um, you know some kind of receipts or something. Um, yeah. Uh, or or make a duplicate copy at the state level and one that someone could keep. Um, well, let me ask you this: what, Who are some of your favorite people? past or present, uh, could be elected or, or not elected? Um, some real... Um, I, I have to... Wow. I haven't been asked that question in a while. <laughs> uh, as far as political figures or... Either or. Uh, okay. I, like, I mean, everybody has to say George Washington. Uh, the other day I was, I was reading some of the documentation from about the time from the Continental Congress when they, they uh, drafted and signed the Constitution. And the, the description of George Washington I thought was very powerful. It basically said that he, he, wasn't, he wasn't in it for the power. He wasn't in it for the political authority. And he would have just been happy enough to go back to his farm and live out the rest of his days. But he was willing to help in the, the founding of our nation and help in the administration of it as serving as the first president of the United States. And uh, some other uh, great people, uh, uh, a, a gentleman from uh, by the name of Ezra Taft Benson, he was a former secretary of agriculture and also a, a former... Uh, uh, president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and uh, he uh, had a very strong and powerful understanding of government and uh, the way it should operate in in, in any society. And uh, I've read a lot of his words, and they have been very, very powerful to me, and and and, and have helped inspire me throughout my campaign. Well, that and sounds great. My mom oh, and my dad. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. but. Those are good answers. Actually, no one has said that yet. So that's a, people oh, really? said George Washington, but no one said their mom or dad yet. So yeah, that's a good answer. Well, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I've I've got some other folks too. I I just friends and other and other folks that they you know they they see that I'm doing this and they, they're just like. They they get a sense of like wow he can do that crazy you know and they they get this this kind of a, you know bit of authority and power about them and not in the, the tyrannical sense by any means but mostly that they you know they can be responsible for their own their own destiny in a, in a sense yeah like a hopefulness that, yeah. And, it, and I, I have to mention my wife, who has been very patient in supporting me throughout this whole campaign process, and and uh, she, she's been absolutely wonderful and patient throughout the whole process, con- considering she's not a fan of politics at all, mm-hmm. and has never really been involved in it. And uh, when I told, or when I mentioned to her I was going to do it, and she said, "Well, why are you going to do it?" I said because nobody else is going to. 
and that's she supported me on just that and and nothing else, no coercion or anything else. So it's been a, a very impressive and enlightening year for me in in, in doing this. So. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, it does, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of things in life that takes courage, and I don't want to compare one towards another, but uh, definitely putting yourself on the ballot, you know, kind of like doing what George Washington did, and of course, he set the precedent of just, uh, you know, two-year term for president, um, but uh, it's... Four-year term. Uh, yeah, two four-year terms, right? Um but, well, uh, I don't know if he – yeah, he did set that precedent. You are, you are, uh, yeah, yeah he didn't put it into it. law, but he kind of, you know, s- yep. set a precedent of it. And um, and y- there's a lot of people that only see Republic. I mean, we've only seen pretty much Republicans and Democrats for the last, you know, hun- since pretty much the Republican Party itself. I mean, when they were a third party. And so, I mean yeah. – um, you know, there's a couple of things that come to mind. Competition. I mean, people are, you know, third parties. There's nothing illegal about being in a third party. Um, you know, we have more than, <laughs> two, there's more than two options in um, most other things. I, I mean, sometimes, uh, you, you know, in your local area, you might only have like two, you know, Internet companies. But who's to say that there shouldn't be more? Um as far yeah. as like television stations go, there's a ton of them nowadays and a ton of media yeah. on the internet and, and et cetera. So that competition helps keep people in check. And even our government is founded on a certain sense of a balance of power. I, I mean, from the uh, house of representatives to the state, to uh, the president, the judicial branch, and you could even expand that out to all of the States themselves um, as another uh, balance of power and, um, and, and beyond. And so uh, I would say the same goes with different political parties, um, you know, and, and we're all individuals. I mean, you know, uh, you're part of a political party, but uh, you're also your own individual. So, well, Anthony, we, we appreciate very much the time you've taken here and uh, on this thorough interview. And that's what we do is, you know, try to cover all the issues so people know where uh, the candidate stands. And um, and I hope you keep pushing for uh, debates because I think uh, the people, the taxpayers who pay to put you on the ballot, um, you know, kind of expect it's kind of a tradition for a long, long time that, you know, people have a debate before they, uh, you know, decide who is elected. So yeah. um, at, definitely uh, would be good for the constituents to see both the um, people or, or all of the people and, and, you know, have them be questioned by the media in front of the public. And, uh, y- you know, of course, uh, that's kind of self-obvious, but, um, well, any final words of wisdom before we end the interview, sir? Well, I, I mean, about the only thing I can say is that if, uh, this young farm boy can go and, and, you know, and, and run for Congress, then, that means anybody can stand up and, and represent those things that they they believe in. Uh, so I I would like to encourage all those people who who feel like their their rights are being trampled on or that they need another option to just stand up and and decide like I did. It, you, you know, and when there wasn't another option here in Idaho, it's instead of being depressed and and bummed out about it, just come to the decision that you know what I can do that yeah so this November 8th I mean if you live in Idaho in the second district you're going to see Anthony Tompkins and that's who we've been talking with um, from the Constitution Party for the U.S. House of Representatives District 2 in Idaho and you're going to see something that uh, you know is going to be something that you haven't usually seen you know you're usually seeing uh, Republican and Democrat now you're going to see the Constitution Party you have, a, I guess, an option to vote for the Constitution. I mean, it's kind of like walking through the <laughs> woods and finding Excalibur or something. You know, uh, you'll see you're just going to find something that's uh, going to be very empowering. And imagine if we sent a couple independent third party candidates to Congress, you know, what kind of message that would send and with the status quo start to feel some competition and uh, ask yourselves what 
you know, would be the uh, pros and cons of that. So, Anthony, thank you very, very much. People can find out more information at Anthony Tompkins, T O M K I N S dot com. And uh, so, even if you're not in Idaho or his specific district, uh, if you're interested in American politics and the U.S. House of Representatives, I would encourage you to take a look, and especially if you are in Idaho, the 2nd District. And so thank you again for your time. We appreciate it very, very much, and good luck in your campaign, Anthony. Thanks, Thomas. I appreciate it immensely. All right. Well, uh, it was good talking with you, and uh, take care, sir. Thanks a lot. Bye.